was a place where there's no trouble, no more pain, no more struggle. Hi there. Thank you so much for listening to Grounded in Maine today. My guest today, his name is Don Cook. Uh, he is a friend of mine in Florida, and he has, uh, since the pandemic, really, he really dove into fermenting, and uh, I find that fascinating. Uh, it's not, <laughs> it's not uh, something that I am super jazzed about, but I'm really curious about it. Uh, and he is loving it and uh, he's just he's all in so um, I just wanted to, sh to have him share some information because the cool thing about fermenting is that it, it really can be so easy and it's so healthy for our our guts um, and it's uh, it's a great way to cut back on waste food waste and uh, well I'll just let him tell you <laughs> Uh, so here is Don. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grounded in Maine today. I am talking with my friend Don. Don, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. good. So Still this is... uh, getting used to fall in Florida, which is summer for anyone else. <laughs> right. So this is Don Cook. Uh, he he lives in Florida. Um, so Don, you and I bonded over some vinegar making videos earlier this year, but you've gone mm -hmm. so much farther than me. Um, <laughs> and you are actually making fermented foods. So yeah. can you go into detail about that? Like, what have you been fermenting? How did that get, how did that start? Well, you know, like all of us, we went through a little, uh, time at home and pandemic and I got bored and I was looking at things and had some extra food from the farmer's market. So I thought, what am I going to do with all this? And uh, started Googling, found sort of a inspirational guy, if you will, Matt G with Pro Home Cooks. He had some videos. I watched them. I was like, oh, there's no way it's this easy. And my first batch of sauerkraut was really just a uh, wide mouth quart ball jar filled up with cabbage and salt and water and it it worked and so I was like okay I probably should look at this a little bit more and uh you know started experimenting watching videos trying to figure out what I can do with oh five heads five heads of cauliflower that were a really good price and I I found a few favorites for sure um sauerkraut um, started out really simple. It's gained a little complexity and, and through time I've tailored it to myself with some jalapenos and carrots and different things to add a little variety. And that's sort of my standard kimchi was what I was really interested in. And it's so darned expensive and it's so cheap to make. And it's really buying some ingredients. Cause there's some, some, there's some things that aren't in the average pantry that you put into kimchi to get started, but watch a couple of videos. It's simple process. And if you like spicy and kimchi type things, that's an adventure on itself. And it's, it's such a good ingredient to cook with, um, or just eat raw, um, or any number of things. And then, as I mentioned, uh, cauliflower, I do a curried cauliflower so it's just curry powder cauliflower and a brine and it makes an amazing crunchy cauliflower snack really great flavor um and then wow. the other one that i've done a couple of times uh is carrots with uh, and the recipe that i got into is sort of a garlic cilantro carrot and and it's a really nice crunchy side it it it's it's been good and and i have a list of things that are on my list of things to try next but uh you know i think vinegars are definitely something that i want to get into and that was a that was a really interesting video because you can make vinegar by accident but um the 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 matt g sorry mike g um, goes through and talks about using dried fruits instead of fresh fruits to make a fruit vinegar. And, and it's a good watch because it's a much better 
process and and looks a lot more stable. There's some funny things that grow when you're fermenting things, and some of them are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them are great. Yeah, I mean, I I used to brew beer, which I guess at the end of the day was fermenting, and and uh, my the guy that taught me how to ferment beer was like there's nothing that'll kill you in beer that you're not going to know is going to kill you before you drink it and i'm like uh please explain and he's like oh if it's bad it'll smell bad and i'm like okay um but it is somewhat true there's nothing in the if if you can get the alcohol content high enough quick enough the bad stuff doesn't grow and that's the secret to fermenting you're doing a a type of fermentation where there's no oxygen and if your salt content's at the right level, nothing bad is really growing in there. Now, if you take the lid off all the time or you live in an area with a lot of bad molds, you can have stuff that starts growing. But um, I do somewhat of a closed fermentation. I've bought things that make that easier. I gave you some links and showed you some stuff. Um, I mean, you don't need anything fancy. Literally a crock pot a crock lid um, and cheesecloth can be how you do it. You can do an open ferment, but I live in Florida and our temperatures are higher and more things grow. So, and I also make bread. So I have yeast in my house and that's something that you don't necessarily want growing. So I do a closed fermentation. I bought a fancy lid and, you know, you can look them up on the internet, YouTube. There's great resources. I gave you some resources and pictures. I'll be um, sharing those. But that makes the process so much simpler because essentially once something starts fermenting, it pushes all the oxygen out of the vessel through the release valve. And then you have an environment where there's no oxygen and, and that keeps things good and clean. And you really want to kind of set it and forget it. You don't want to be opening it up every day and stirring it. That's every opportunity to introduce bad things, but your fermentation um, varies by the product that you're working with. It can go as fast as two days it can go as long as 14 days. It depends on what you're fermenting, how much sugar it has, and how funky you want it to be. <laughs> um, sauerkraut can be very kind of crunchy and mild at, at a few days. And you can have some people that are like, oh, no, I want the stuff that's really, really funky, like 14 days in. And you're like, mm, I'm somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Awesome. The carrots sound really interesting. I have not like, I have not enjoyed a lot of fermented foods. I'm not a fan of sauerkraut. And I don't know if it's just because I've had it like commercially produced. Um, but I have tried, there's a, there's a ferment, there's a company that does fermenting here in Maine locally. Um, and they make, uh, it's called Buxton beets. So it's like fermented beets and okay. that is super tasty, but I could yeah. not like, I couldn't, I, you were telling me before that your mom has a really sensitive nose and I have that as well. So they, I was told that there was another, um, uh, what is it? It was like a daikon radish. Um, oh yeah. Kraut yeah. type thing. The, and the I, big I could Asian... not get past the smell. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, you, you have the luxury of having a, a temperature spectrum at parts of the year where you could just do this outside. Um, I don't have a lot of perfect days for that. I think the perfect temperature is supposed to be basically room temperature. Um, and in Florida, that only happens with air conditioning. Um, <laughs> we're either cold or hot. But I think you would have a lot more of the year... That, that you'd be able to do this out in a fruit room or a porch or something like that with much more ventilation. Um, and in the wintertime, I could probably do it in my garage for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole cycle of, of beet called kvass, I think it's called K V A S S. Mm -hmm. And you actually use the beets to make a fermented juice and it's supposed to be really good to drink. It's great. I mean, the reason why fermenting exists is one, it preserves food. 
So, okay, it's a way of preserving food. When you have abundance, you can ferment it, put it in a cool, dark place, and it will last for a, a long time. Um, again, there is still somewhat of a fermenting action, even in cool temperatures. So if you take a glass jar, put a lid on it and clamp the lid down on it, you have a bomb should the temperature go above, say, 80 degrees for any period of time because it gets real active and it will explode. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in a refrigerator, you know, um, if I have, I've started doing half gallons of sauerkraut and kimchi and that lasts me a month and a half usually. Um, and I'll, you know, as long as you take it out of the fridge once a month and sort of burp it, if you're not using it every day or so you know once a week kind of run through the refrigerator and and open the lids and let the excess gas out and there shouldn't be a problem but um if i had a refrigerator full of this during a hurricane like we just had and didn't have refrigeration it, you'd be taking the lids off and you might lose some things so um it's not like where my where i'm from where i have a root cellar and every like grandma used to do this in a great big crock and and uh you know it, it sat out on the front porch underneath there and then when it was done it went to the root cellar or the root cellar or whatever you want to call it um and so but the other reason you want to do it is it's actually a really good way to unlock nutrients a lot of people have a hard time digesting raw vegetables um and and getting all the nutrients out of them and so it actually you let the you let the bacteria do the hard work for you. And then what you're eating is sort of a nutrient rich and, and gut biome friendly food because it actually feeds your gut biome as well. So there's good aspects from that. Um, there's a lot of um, books when you have autoimmune diseases and different things where fermented foods are very friendly for your nutrition needs, especially around oh. certain medications and regimes that it, it unlocks a lot of nutrients that your body doesn't have the ability to digest and unlock. That's very cool. Um, I didn't really know. I mean, I knew that it's supposed to, I know that it's supposed to be healthy for you. Um, I didn't really under, I didn't really know about the autoimmune or the, you know, some people had a hard time digesting. I just personally, I don't, my body doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, or my taste buds, I should say. My taste buds don't right. really love it. But well, there, I really mean, there are other experience. You probably yeah. grew up like I did with pickles that were canned. Right. Like dill pickles were canned. They weren't fermented. And so that concept of a fermented pickle, like a cucumber fermented pickle at a Jewish deli, it's different. It's just a different type of experience. And so I haven't gone down the path of fermenting cucumbers for pickles. There's a couple things out there. When I started reading about it, um, they don't come out as crisp and as and as um, snappy. That crisp snap is tannins. Mm -hmm. And so you actually need to put something into the pickle jar, which commercially, I think they use alum when they're pickling and it keeps things crisp. But um, you can also just put grape leaves in as you're fermenting and the tannin from the grape leaves apparently does the same thing i haven't i haven't experimented with pickles yet that's something that i want to do but at the current price of cucumbers i'm not exactly experimenting with them um <laughs> someday if i find a, a an abundance of cucumbers i might go down that path there's some interesting things you can do with zucchini and relishes that are fermented um, and that might be closer to something that you're used to but fermenting is definitely there's a there's a, a funk to it. It's a it's a acidic sort of taste profile, not quite vinegar, but but similar. And then um, the texture is a little bit different. It's not that commercial crisp pickle or crisp like I don't know how they pickle okra and it comes out crisp. It's like the okra has two states for me deep fried and slimy there's never it's one or the other so <laughs> you see these pickled okra and you're like i don't know how that happens but um there's people that ferment pretty much everything yeah. um and it's in it's it's interesting 
actually, you don't think about it, but hot sauce, Tabasco and Sriracha are fermented. Um, and so that's something that I want to experiment with is Sriracha. Um, although that's an open ferment, meaning it, it it's just left out in the open with gauze over the top of it. And it takes about five days and you stir it. But there's supposedly enough stuff in that that nothing bad grows. <laughs> supposedly. Well, it's a, it'd be a good winter project, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I don't know if you've been around Sriracha very much, but it's it's an odiferous process all by itself. I'm sure that's going to fill the house full of all kinds of fun smells. Well, that doesn't bother you, though. Not as much, no. I think having air conditioning 24 hours a day pulls a lot of odors out of the house. True, um, it does a lot of filtering, right? They have filters. Yeah, yeah. and it, it just keeps the air moving. And I think uh, somehow it seems like it is better. So, but cool. uh, did you have any fermenting questions? Um, I'm curious how, like when you purchased your equipment, your uh -huh. fermenting equipment, what was like, just sort of like a ballpark cost on that? Oh gosh. Um, I'll probably, I can send that to you afterwards. Okay. Um, and and it's sort of pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. I mean, oh. you used to be able to go to Ace Hardware and buy um, ball canning jars for next to nothing. And then all of a sudden it was expensive. So I They're sunk like some money. They're like triple the price. Yeah, I sunk some money into just half gallon wide mouth canning jars. And then I have quart wide mouth. Wide mouth is definitely advantageous because you're pushing things down and putting things into a jar. Um you need to keep things submerged and you can do that a couple of ways. Um, some people will just take a cabbage leaf and, and put it over the top of everything and then put some sort of weight on that cabbage leaf. And, and it can be anything from, you know, glass beads to water in a Ziploc bag. You just need something, everything that you're fermenting, you want below the water level in the jar. Water is produced through the fermentation. So the water level rises as the fruit or the vegetable sort of, breaks down a little bit um but uh i got some glass weights that were really um pretty affordable at the time that i got them i think they're kind of expensive now but they sort of fit right in a wide mouth jar and sit right on top of whatever you're fermenting and if they're if your water level is a little bit low you can add water and uh and they're really handy through the whole process sauerkraut and things like that isn't too buoyant but um cauliflower tries to rise to the top and and you want to keep in everything under that um water line gotcha. uh, the fermentation lids were probably the most expensive and and in the picture i have a very low cost one that sits in like a a, a jar ring so it's a piece of silicone that sits on top of the jar and then you put the lid down and it just has a simple slit in the top of it that lets the gas out as it builds up and those are really affordable cool. i have a lid that screws on it has a silicone top on it um but it also has a couple of features it looks much more like a regular jar top with a silicone lid built into it and then it has a little dial on it because you kind of want to know what day you start your ferment. And if you're like me, you do stupid things like forget and, and I don't count well. And so it's just one through 31 on the top of the jar. And you can at least mark that when you start your process and then count out. And, and cause there's a bit of guesstimation, I guess it's like, Oh, it should take between three and seven days. <laughs> and you're like, so you're looking at it and trying to figure out what's going on. And if you've, ferment it and throw it in the fridge and it's not fermented enough for you, you can pull it out and it'll start fermenting again. So it's a pretty forgiving process. Oh, that's very cool. Um, I got a, a tamper, which is like a wood dowel, like a, it's like two inches across and tapered so that you can hang on to it. That could literally be anything else, but it came in a package when I ordered the fermentation lids and it wasn't much of an add on price. So um it's kind of an ex expensive to buy it by itself and it's a luxury item you could do literally just punch it down with your hand in the jar my hands don't really fit in the jar so i needed something to really compress it um the the 
kimchi and sauerkraut, you really want to get it compressed because you need to get all that air out. Because if there's any gaps or air down in the jar, um, that can contaminate the process as well. And let's see. Oh, you know, just a good old fashioned wide mouth canning funnel. Um, I have a plastic one. My mom has a stainless steel one that I look at every year and go, you don't use that. You mm -hmm. should send that home with me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I got a plastic one at Ace Hardware for like 99 cents or something like that. And it's handy because it just kind of helps you contain the mess. If, if you've ever looked at kimchi or watched some of the stuff that goes in it, there's some funky stuff that go in at the beginning of it. And you don't want those splashing all over your counter. It's nice <laughs> to have a funnel. What, and, what kind of stuff goes into kimchi? <laughs> now you've got yeah. me curious. <laughs> so, well, fish sauce, which is fermented mm. and an Asian cooking ingredient is typically there. And it depends on the journey you want to take on kimchi. Kimchi is one of these things where in America, we think of kimchi as one thing. And there's apparently, you know, every family has a recipe for kimchi in Korea. And some have fish, some have shrimp. Some have um, all sorts of different things in them for flavoring. It's a flavor enhancer. Um, and you know, some of our palates are not really used to that. That might take some getting used to. I'm more of a vegetable, kimchi, spicy person. But even with that, you 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 make a glutinous rice concoction so you take glutinous rice flour cook it it makes a paste and that is sort of the starchy component that helps the start of the kimchi and binds everything together and you actually put sweet things into it like asian pear or apples or different things like that and so there's a very spicy sweet and starchy component kind of to the base of kimchi and it's this paste and then you cover all your vegetables in it like you'll see there's a whole head sort of kimchi type process where they leave the great big napa cabbage sort of in quarters and they go in and like paint this paste on each leaf of the cabbage and then put it all back together wrap it up and then store it underground for a year um those are super funky. And then there's the kind that we're sort of used to now, which is all the vegetables sort of chopped up in bite-sized pieces and, and just sort of mixed together and put in a jar to ferment. Um, and I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do with it. It produces a lot of liquid, makes a great starter for Bloody Marys. It's spicy, it's red. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of stuff you can do with fermented foods and the juices and and they're super good like um when i went through a course of antibiotics um that was one of the things when i first started experimenting with certain foods to get your gut biome built back up and pineapple's good and there's various different fruits and vegetables but um natural organic live fermented foods are really helpful i mean if you're buying canned sauerkraut at the grocery store that's shelf stable everything's been killed it's a dead food product and when you're live fermenting at home you're creating a living food product it's got stuff in it it's like yogurt you know it's got things in it that our body likes so mm -hmm. Okay. All right. How how long would something that was fermented last? I know you said like a month and a half. It'll take you to go through like a batch of sauerkraut, but I mean, how long would they? I mean, and of course, the the environment's going to have a lot to. Yeah, with with good refrigeration, I have stuff that I've kept in in the refrigerator use the term kept it might have got lost in the back of the refrigerator but it was something that i found um a year later and um through the videos you'll see that there's sometimes you'll get a cloudy white film on the top of something that's fermented and that's generally safe but uh there's there's other colors and odors that you look for and since i don't want to get into any liability type things i'll just say do some research on the internet and mike g at promo cooks very instructional, very sciencey. If you want to go down that path, 
Um, you'll watch other people and they're just like, oh, salt it with your heart. And it's like, mm, I'm not one of those people. I'm like, I want to like, and, and so he does the calculation. Like you fill the jar up with whatever you want to ferment. You add the water, you weigh it. You dump the water out, you weigh it. Then based on how much the water weight was, you create a salt solution of a certain percentage. And he kind of gives you a calculation chart of how much salt goes in. And that salt solution is slightly different based on the sugar content of what you're fermenting. So he gets sciency. He's got pens out and charts. And, and, and I watched his video probably 30 times taking notes as he was going along. Cause unlike some people we know, he doesn't have transcription that I'm aware of. And so you watch his video and you can't go download all the content. So um, it was painful, but uh, there's books. Um, but he's also uh, cute. I mean, he's easy to look at. <laughs> he is. And, and I like pretty much everything about anyone that's passionate and cooks and is passionate about it. And you can clearly see that he's just super into it. And it's a whole rabbit hole with him as well. Cause I mean, he went down the whole bread baking path and I'd done that before, but I've never done sourdough and live, live starter and all that kind of stuff. I'm just a standard make bread mm. yeast out of a jar, do it. Right. Um, and he has tons of videos on that and you know i plug in this guy um, but it really is a good watch he's entertaining to watch he has some good ideas um does a lot of great comparisons of techniques and uh shows his failures which is even more useful than showing all the successes he he shows you straight out i did this it didn't work here's how i know it didn't work this is what it looks like um i i don't like the people that are so curated that you can't see when something goes wrong he'll show you like eh, this went bad <laughs> right yeah and it's and it's also it's so nice that he's done so much of the research and he's done a lot of um yeah. wow i should get we should get paid for this um but like he's done <laughs> well, so nice. much work right yeah hey mike yeah. g <laughs> um but How's he's it done go? so Drop much us work a that... like and a subscribe no i don't right know. right um... yeah find find pro home cooks and like and subscribe and tell them yeah. that amy and don sent you yeah. um but, but there's other resources i mean literally yeah. if you want to know how to make kimchi type it in on the internet you're going to get a thousand videos within seconds and you know some of them are good some of them are bad watch a few find a mixture um you know it's a very forgiving process i stayed very much true to a, a recipe the first several times I did it because I was just like I'm I'm I want to be able to do this I want to know that it's going to work I want to repeat it I don't want to waste things right once I've done it a few times then it's like anything it's like oh you know what I can experiment let me throw some basil in there hmm that didn't work <laughs> um but you know it's it's something that you can experiment with and I tell you what I've I can always find a use for something that isn't great i can you know chop it up and throw it into a salad um if something one of the things like sauerkraut if you don't like it cook with it um i'll, I'll send you a recipe for sauerkraut pork in a crock pot and it is really good and and that fermented taste cooks out while you're cooking it and you end up with just this great pork sauerkraut crock pot winter meal <laughs> Does that make you hungry now? <laughs> it does. It does. I'm like, oh, okay. Right, it's on my mom's rotation every time I go home. It's like, did you want the pork and sauerkraut? And it's like, yes. Always. <laughs> That's really um, cool. And I love, Don, that you that you make it sound so easy. And that, that makes it sound doable. Um, well, I mean, in all fairness, I grew up in a family where we froze, canned, um, preserved... My mom made fruit leathers in the 70s because we lived in a dry, arid climate and things like that. Um, we we were not wealthy. Um, we grew things. And when, when we had abundance, it was preserved. And uh, we had a deep freeze and a root cellar. So the, a lot of this stuff is sort of, oh, I know how to do this. Um, or I've seen somebody do it or whatever. And today it's so easy because you just have all the recipes at your fingertips, all the tools to make your life easier. Um, but if anyone thinks that fermenting would be hard to get into, you literally just need a clean vessel that doesn't leak glass, ceramic, 
Uh, you don't really want to ferment in metals because the metals can react with the acids. But a glass, a glass vessel, a ceramic vessel, gauze, or a lid, and letting letting the gases out. Those are your tools. Salt. Um, you know, watch the videos. You do want to use a salt. You don't want to use iodized salt. Um, and you don't want to use a salt that's, you know, you don't want to use fleur de sel because it's so expensive. So you're looking for a good canning salt type like thing, something that's not iodized, yeah. kosher. Um, and uh, your your raw ingredients are, you know, pretty reasonable unless you're out there going peak price season vegetables. I mean, the whole point is this is something you do when you have abundance. So awesome. um, it's a great preservation trick. I love that. I I love that you kind of carried it from being young. Like you just, <laughs> you just have, you have that like squirrel it away kind of mindset, um, which is really cool. And you're, and, and kind of like a playful nature. So like you're, you're not yeah. afraid to try new things. I, I would totally do like buy the recipe every time. And I'd be like, why does this taste weird? Because I did the <laughs> recipe and, you know, and I have something to blame it on, not like me playing around with the recipe, but. Well, I you know, uh, we'll, we'll get you started on this. And then on a future podcast, you can uh, express your results. I'll, I'll, I'll get you started on something simple, either the cauliflower or the carrots or something like that. Carrots. And, and... <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I, I'm jealous of you because I see where you like go out and get all these vegetables and all that kind of stuff and they're all organic and natural and you know Florida's just it's not as abundant with vegetables and fruit um, most of it comes in and, and it's weird for me our growing season like if you want to raise tomatoes you're planting tomatoes now because it's too hot in the summertime and it's just a weird weird I don't know how people ever decided to live here before the modern conveniences. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, we've got nematodes and things. You can't grow tomatoes in the ground after a couple of years because the nematodes are too prolific. And it's, it's a whole different, the farmer's almanac growing that I grew up with doesn't apply here. It's a different, it's a different thing. Ah, uh, well, I mean, we have our own struggles here. We have, oh, yeah. I, we like had, well, me at my house we had a really crappy garden this year we just have such bad um cucumber beetles and they just oh, like okay. decimate anything that they can find and then the squash beetles come when the squash starts to come out so we had yeah. no zucchini no squash um oh. it was super bummer but other people did well so that's what farm drop is for yeah 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 no my mom complained about tomatoes all summer long they just never they just never produced and that was a really sad summer i went home and was waiting for that tomato sandwich and it didn't happen uh, shoot yeah <laughs> and it's just so weird because like i had i had some tomatoes but i didn't have a lot of tomatoes but then someone down the street has like buco tomatoes I'm like dude but you just have yeah. to make friends with those people man you too. My mom is the <laughs> zucchini queen. She's like your, your, she's the reason you go out your front door and there's a giant zucchini on your step. <laughs> I love that. I think I, I challenge people. I dare you to throw a zucchini in my car. Somebody, yeah. I heard like someone said, keep your windows closed in your car because people will drop zucchini in there. And I've never, I'd never, never heard that, that until gift. this year. Yeah, no, I'd be completely fine with that. And like I said, we grew up in a household where nothing went to waste. If it was bad, we figured out a way to do it. Um, but I mean, zucchini, zucchini bread. Um, my mom grates zucchini and just freezes it to have grated zucchini to make bread because her freezer space is so limited that mm -hmm. she's like, well, I don't want to make a whole zucchini bread and freeze it because it takes up too much space in my freezer. And I'm like, oh, okay. and it smells oh, so good okay. when it's fresh. <laughs> well, true, true. <laughs> That's why I totally like I have I have it in little in little packages, zucchini yeah. shredded up um, yeah. because you never know. You never know what you might feel like doing later on. I've got a. I might have to try rhubarb every you. You northern people have rhubarb and I'm just so jealous, but uh, I might try fermenting some rhubarb chutney. That sounds like an interesting experiment. Mm. Um. 
but uh yeah i'm a big fan of rhubarb and it's not not common down here that's unfortunate it is well so don well, when i when i say the word sustainability what does that mean to you ah uh, reducing waste finding a purpose for things looking my, my new thing is when i look at something that i'm buying i'm asking why does it need all this packaging why does it need all this stuff um i think i told you i i i really kind of stopped shaving um during the pandemic i wasn't going anywhere doing anything and i would just trim my head and my uh beard with clippers um and then i started looking at how much i was spending on disposable razors and the convenience and all the waste and so i found a little company out there did some research and got a large investment up front you know a hundred plus dollars to get a stainless steel safety razor but uh, once you're in that investment a very sustainable replaceable recyclable stainless steel blades to make a triple blade or a double blade razor and I was a little scared because the only safety razors I ever dealt with were the ones that grandma and grandpa and mom and dad had when I was little. And, and I wouldn't just, let you touch them. Don't go near yeah. that. And I got a better shape with this thing than anything I've shaved with as a convenience disposable razor. It's called leaf shaving. Um, go on their site, put in your email, get some discount codes. Um, it's a great product. And I think once you get over the initial investment, for a really high quality, well-made stainless steel razor. The the replacement razors are like 12 bucks for 50 blades. And if you use a triple blade razor, um, I'll go through three disposable razors to shave my full head and beard because I have a really coarse hair. And I can use this. You take everything out, clean it, let it dry, put it back together seven eight times before i find that it starts to pull on my skin and i need to replace the razors so i think it's a higher quality product myself um seems to work really well um i looked at you know soda i i was buying a case of fancy sparkling soda water flavored mildly flavored the essence waved near it you know um, those bougie flavored soda waters and the expense, the shipping, the waste. I was just like, ah, I need to figure out how to do this better at home. Looked at a couple, Do I'm a research and then buy kind of person. I kind of looked at the different products for home carbonation. And some of them are very proprietary and you can only do water. And I found a company called Drinkmate that makes a carbonation system that's very portable you can actually take it with you um and you can carbonate anything that you want i think we might have been at a podcast learning retreat and we were carbonating cocktails and wine and all sorts of things you, it juices um, does avoid the warranty it works very well and um you can add all your own flavors to it so um that's that's sort of my other area where I've, I don't have cans. I don't have to recycle. I have glass bottles that I make it in. It comes with plastic and I'm fine with that. Um, but you know, it, it, that's soda water. I gave up drinking flavored sodas and sugar-free sodas. So I was going through a lot of soda water and it's expensive and a lot of waste. So I'm, I have a long way to go. Uh, our recycling program here in Florida is okay, not great. Um, so, I mean, not a plug. I don't. We don't get anything from this because we haven't figured out that part of this. Yes. But um, it's a product that I like. It it it, uh, and I like the fact that you could ferment, ferment that you could <laughs> carbonate anything that you wanted. Um, I mostly do water, but um, I have some flavor drops that I like that I found that are not full of chemicals and not full of sweeteners. It's just a pure food flavoring or fruit flavoring. And, uh, you know, it, it's nice if you want a flavored drink. Um, I use it when I make a cocktail because I like fizzy things. So 
it's it's nice and and even the co2 cartridges are somewhat sustainable in that they have a recycling program so when you use the co2 cartridge you can send it back to them and you get a credit for the next time you buy so um at least it's not pure waste that's awesome that's really great and did you say that you can ferment not now i'm saying it (laughs) that you can carbonate juices as well yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted to carbonate apple juice, things with pulp in it, you kind of have to watch because you can clog things up. Um, so fresh squeezed orange juice might be a little weird. But um, yeah, it and it actually works really good if, if you want to carbonate wine. Like uh, sometimes in the summertime, it's really nice to have a fizzy drink. And if you have a bottle of rosé and you're not too super impressed with it, well, throw in some apple juice and make it fizzy. It'll work. Shoes it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Every once in a while you buy a bottle of wine and you're like, ooh, that needs some help. <laughs> <laughs> Again, nothing gets thrown away in my household. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Well, now that you've got that fancy, fancy equipment, um, yeah. that's very cool. So it's called Drink Mate, you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, there, there's compatible products. Soda Stream, Drink Mate. There's sure. several different products out there. And I'm not, endorsing one over the other i just looked at it and said i like the fact that i could but that i could use it on other things than just water and and i like the footprint of it it doesn't use any electricity it doesn't i mean some of them have gotten to the point where it's almost like you know too much and it's just a co2 cartridge and you pop the bottle in it has a special lid that locks in for carbonating and then there's a pressure lid that you put on after you've carbonated if you want to store it that's cool i mean some of them look almost like a curing machine like very yeah yeah and this is at the end of the day it has a a fair amount of i i would prefer if it were metal for lasting and sustainability it's plastic but uh you know it 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 seems to be well made it lasts um it's not something i'm going to throw away after using it so i mean it's it's not that bad but it would be nice to see if, if i had any product insider suggestion it'd be a, i'd like glass bottles rather than plastic i don't like drinking out of plastic or i'm always concerned about it and uh i would like even stainless um i think because then traveling you know i I like to you know if you're on a road trip throw a couple of cold bottles in and and be there and i think a stainless bottle would be really nice you can always pour your sparkling water into something but as you know you lose a lot of the carbonation when you do that right the transfer But there are some, they haven't come that I'm aware of a glass bottle for this product, but they've started doing a new line that has glass bottles to begin with. So, you know, I think they're evolving over time. I think everyone's sort of taking a better stance at, or I choose to spend my money with people that seem to be choosing sustainable or something. I, you know, there's this craze with yogurt where it's like, it's in a glass container so that it's not plastic and i'm like yeah but what do you do with all these right. glass containers when when you've got all of them it's like i still have this thing that i don't know what to do with right um, well and those you know. glass containers don't come with lids right right it's a it's a disposable lid and so it'd be like you know if you were giving me a a ball canning jar with yogurt in it that after i'm done because believe me um, <laughs> that's one of my other youth things is it's like you know different people open the jar and empty it and throw the jar away and my mom and aunts are just like no (laughs) you know it's sort of like there's a jar jar. there's a jar library downstairs at my mom's house because the stuff that comes from one of her sister-in-laws is you you, it's all in one area and when she's done she washes the jar and puts it back and those go back those go back to who gave you whatever i mean it's it's those jars are yours you just put the product in as a gift and and it's you know that i've grown up that way where things are sustainable you know it it, it wasn't a disposable society um you know it eh, i'm old enough that i kind of grew up in the hippie uh moment as a kid and and uh there was a lot of sustainability nature um preservation that was a big part of my my grandparents were children of homesteaders so you know they they 
lived through the depression and never really got out of that it was we didn't have pizza kits from we didn't have fast food we didn't we didn't have craft macaroni and cheese dinner it was it was all made from scratch it was you know those those convenience products don't exist to this day though they don't exist in my mother's house other than a few canned soups and and some soup mixes and things like that it's for emergencies it's, yeah <laughs> yes there's, there's no there's no packaged frozen lasagna in my mom's freezer the the lasagna in the freezer was made she always does a double batch and freezes one i mean that's just the mentality that's so. awesome i love that yeah and do you do that do you you do do that right i am uh i i have an instant pot i am a big fan of cooking once and using many leftovers are my best friend i have friends that won't eat leftovers period and i'm like oh man Why? no i'll make a if it was good once it'll or... be great later <laughs> It's even better later. Right? And all you have to do is wash the dish that you heat it up in. So, I mean, it's like, it's the perfect thing. Yeah. I'm a big fan of big. I have a people are like, why do you have an eight quart instant pot? And it's like, because I like to do a turkey breast in it. But I mean, I do full roasts and, you know, freeze some, eat some, uh, repurpose it in meals later. So, you know, I, I think. That's another aspect. What is the food energy that you're using to cook something um, and and cooking every night? You know, it, I don't need to have that expense. I don't need the heat in the house. Um, what a great gift that was from for your from your family. Yeah, to, to teach you that. Yeah, it's I'll, I'll look at people that are just like, oh, my God, what happens if the world ends? We don't have any food. And it's like. We have food hmm. everywhere. We have food, even in Florida, we have food everywhere. There's all sorts of things that are edible. It's <laughs> just, you know, what's edible and what isn't. Right. You know how to preserve it. And I live confidently knowing that I, if we get to the end times, I know how to survive. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I know that some people go a little overboard, but um, I love, I love that, that kind of mindset of, I don't know. Cooking less. I love cooking less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you cook one meal and you don't have to cook two other times, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a great trick. Kids try it. For um, real. And if you don't like leftovers, then, then what I'll do is I just cook something without a lot of spices and seasoning and have a cooked protein that then I can add in with a little bit of rice or some vegetables. And if I want Mexican, I put, you know, my taco seasoning on it. If I want uh, uh, a pasta dish, I put in pasta sauce. It's, it's, you can go very specific or you can go very general. And, and I like that whole aspect of readily available meals. We, we all live busy lives and it's like, I don't want to spend an hour and a half cooking dinner. Every single ever. night. Right. Ever. <laughs> um, For sure. So, but uh, yeah. Cool. Well, looking forward to seeing you possibly in, in the next couple Week weeks. Week and a half. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're making plans. We're making yeah. plans. Yeah. Uh, so Don, uh, this has been super enlightening and I'm so grateful for your time. Um, if people want to follow what you've been working on, how would they find you? Well, I haven't actually, I've, I've gone through how to podcast and what to podcast and I've secured domains, but I don't want to give them yet because I'm still pretty busy with a full-time job and travel. So I haven't launched those, but uh, I'm completely fine. I'll, I'll give you my Instagram. I actually have to find out what it is because I'm so bad with social media. I don't <laughs> know what it is. I just I think you're it. Don P. Cook. Oh yeah, you tag me. Yeah, that's a that's a good way. Instagram's probably the best. Um, if you have anything, and if I'm doing anything, I usually will post it. Um, and I haven't done anything for a while because it's just been well, we we had a hurricane and stuff. There, there was like <laughs> this whole like weather thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In we're, Florida, knock on wood, we're past that now. 
Um, oh, true. Is that is hurricane season? It's not really over, right? Technically, the end of November. But see, I also work part time with a baseball team here locally and a soccer team, so um, it just now I'm heading into my slow season. So I'm going to start talking about how laying out some episodes and and start this podcasting journey for myself. Um, I'm just a control freak. And so I need to have like a, a season mapped out or something in my head. I'm not a free spirit. I can't just start. I need to have a plan. <laughs> that makes me like so you. happy. I need to be more like you. Oh, isn't that something? Isn't that something? That so. is, that's funny. Um, but anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd just like to take a moment and thank my guests today for being with me and teaching me so much. I need to thank Buzzsprout for hosting the podcast. I'd like to thank Jane Bolduck for her musical genius and Becca Coffron for her beautiful podcast artwork. I'd also like to thank you for listening today. I will see you next time. They'll come a day. To have and hold me A heart that's strong And so sincere Just tell me How do I get there From here Oh tell me How do I get there From here Cause here Happy tears and wonder how the